So, I'm Amanda Armagost. I'm Dr. Abbasi. I'm John Siegel. And this is Essence of Life. Well, we are going to talk today about the uh, medical innovation and uh, as well maybe a little talk about the history of medical innovation if uh, time allows us compare it to other medical innovation because Amanda, you remember one of the things you asked me first uh, when we start working on the, the marketing for inspired spine and older, you asked me a question. Before you send actually your grandpa father to me. Yeah, I did send my grandpa actually to see Dr. Abbasi. He ended up not needing the procedure done, but I was wondering why is Olaf not the standard of care? And uh, you know, we have been uh, scratching our head, John, for, for a long time. For five years, Mr. For, for, for you, five yeah. years. And right. even, even much longer for me. And I think if you, want, if you would like to dissect that uh, uh, matter today, on the medical side, on the business side, but as well on the uh, lay person side, to find out if you can do a surgery with one thirtieth of the risk of infection, if you can do a surgery with a one tenth of blood loss, and a surgery that literally put you back on your life within weeks rather than within the months and years, why isn't this uh, becoming standard of care? Um, I think we should start uh, with a little bit of a history. Um, I'm Dr. Balsi, I'm a neurosurgeon. I'm trained in three continents, but I did my residency um, in Texas. I went through 13 years of residency before I started practicing independently. I did a half residency in Germany, then research in Stanford. I actually um, wrote algorithms to use the medical technology and computer and uh, kind of uh, imaging in the war. In neurosurgery, that is still a big deal, where we instead of, you know, make a big opening, we make small opening. And uh, when in 2000, actually 1999, I joined Stanford uh, Image Guidance Lab, um, we started working on the spine. We created a machine uh, that could use uh, navigation to help the surgeon to do um, spinal navigation. So I'm inherently uh, into the medical innovation. After that, I did uh, one year of uh, residency in Dartmouth Hitchcock College, and then I did uh, additional eight years of residency in Galveston and Houston, including MD Anderson. And then, um, so I had a long training. In 2012, uh, somebody told me, in 2012, somebody told me that um, they have seen somebody, uh, a surgeon in Atlanta, being able to do a surgery, a spinal fusion, under one hour and send the patient home the same day. And um, this was exactly my word, bullshit, it's not happening. And I think my blessing was I didn't just say bullshit, it's not happening, but I said, bullshit, not happening, I want to see it. And I did go to Atlanta, and a good friend of mine, a good surgeon now, uh, that's still practicing, um, performed this surgery in 55 minutes. And uh, that I walked, I watched that patient walking to his car with his family and driving home about two, three hours after the surgery. I was an accomplished surgeon by then, but I still could not believe my eyes. And I. I, if somebody else would have told me, I would have not seen that. I still couldn't believe that. But I saw with my own eyes that patient after a surgery that in my residency would be seven hour surgery with a half a gallon of blood loss. I saw that patient after 55 minute surgery and after two hours observation walking home. At that point, I knew something. I, I, observed something major, something that is going to really change that. I was a little bit of a naive, even though I wasn't uh, uh, you know, a, a young man. I, I thought that uh, if anybody who sees that, anybody look at this data, um, has no choice but uh, learn this and that, uh, that a new era in the spine, sur spine surgery is going to be ushered in. So why do you think that more people aren't learning this procedure after your reaction 
why do you think other people don't have the same reaction? Well, um, no, certainly you know, one of the first points is many people say, um, bullshit, I don't believe it, and just walk away. And I think it, the, the, I, the important thing here is um, maybe we should turn to John, who has inherited the knowledge of the economic of it, um, considering the impact of the spine surgery in our lives, in our, in US, in our actual, like your grandfather has spine problem. He came to me, he had problem, but he didn't need surgery. Yeah. And uh, uh, so in the spine, spine, we are not just about surgery, but this is a common problem. This is a public health issue. John, do you want to introduce yourself first and then tell us a little about um, the, how you came to uh, to this uh, innovation and a little about the economic, the impact of spine uh, on, on the U.S. economy and overall U.S. healthcare? Sure. Sure. So my name is John Siegel. I'm the CEO of uh, Inspire Spine. I met Hamid about six years ago, started working with him to essentially help him build a product engine to support the demand and growth for these minimally invasive techniques. Okay, during this time, I've learned that right now, the uh, cost of uh, spine-related ailments in this country is about $50 billion per year. Sorry, and with respect to this particular issue, if all of the lumbar fusion surgeries converted to the technique that uh, Dr. Abbasi is speaking about right now, it would deliver a savings of over three billion dollars just not in, just in perioperative savings alone. What does that mean, John? So that just means savings in the time and the cost to treat the patient during the surgery as well as immediately post-op. Does it okay. include the less risk of infection as well? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. But what that doesn't include are all of the ancillary impacts of chronic back pain. So people, you know, that, that continue to have to take opioids, people in, in terms of lost productivity in the workplace, which that would add, you know, probably another $100 billion. Yeah, but let's ask actually Amanda a question. You know, I know that your grandfather had some back problem. Did you ever have to take time off and help your family for any ailment in general? Um, not as much my grandpa as my grandma, but yeah, I do spend one day every week kind of doing things for my grandma, whether it's just stuff around the house, driving her around, but I'm not the only one out of my family. I take one day, My each of my brothers take a day and my mom takes a day. So, so that's a lot of man hours for one person. They, they really add up in the sense of when the people, especially when they get older, especially people with spine problem, they literally need a lot of help just to live. And that, I think, is one of our uh, main impact. Not only we made a seven hour surgery, one hour surgery, not only we uh, literally made a, a liter of blood loss to a 50 cc of blood loss and send them home instead of in seven days, in 1.6 days, I think that's our statistic right now. But as well, we put them back on a path to be independent so much faster. And we have a good track record to show that, that we have, uh, like, uh, we have, I have personally taken 1,200 patient testimonial for same reason. Um, and you ask about why people don't jump on the bandwagon. And for some people, you have been as well told, this is good, too good to be true. Absolutely, and from from my perspective, from the business angle, with any new product or service or any new type of innovation in any new market, there is always a high degree of skepticism, and that is especially so. It's especially acute in healthcare, and most notably so in spine, and that's actually for good reason. Okay, because throughout history, there's been a lot of all snake oil. Uh, the solutions, as well as some solutions that initially seemed very promising and had initial good results, but you know the three, five, uh, and seven-year results, they ended up failing. Yeah, I so, can't tell you thirsty of them. Yeah, sure. So there's a natural skepticism, which actually I believe that's healthy. I and 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 I consider this to be a rational or 
productive resistance. Yeah, um, and I absolutely agree and that in special medicine we have to be very skeptical about accepting blindly new things. But I think um, the, there is a healthy skepticism and there is an obstructionism that uh, we can see both happening always in any industry. Well, to your point, uh, Hamid, the obstructionism, as you call it, I have a different name for it. It's called protectionism. <laughs> All right, so the other key obstacle to the widespread adoption of something that has been demonstrated to be medically superior, both in terms of risk profile and of patient outcomes, is quite frankly the power of incumbent interests. Right? Any new disruptive innovation that's going to essentially, you know, uh, threaten them, they're a natural reaction, just like anybody else. I'm, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus here, but that's a natural reaction to protect their turf. And again, especially acute in healthcare, most notably Spartan. Now, um, you know, to, for the people to understand what you are talking about, um, first of all, by the time you are 50 years old, there's only about 34% chance you don't have spine problem. By the time you're 60 years old, there's only less than 5% risk chance that you don't have spine problem. So when you say spine problem, is this like a consistent spine problem or like you throw your back out one time and then you go to the chiropractor? A combination. A combination, but by the time you're 70 years old, that chance is less than 1% to 2% that you don't have spine problems. So this is a very common problem that if all of us have to deal in our life. A certain percentage of those people need a surgery. And the, the, a certain percentage of those people need a kind of surgery that the disc, I compare it to my patient, like a tire of a car, it wears and tears and eventually that tire is not usable. In a situation like that, we take the tire out put uh, something inside to lift the bone and then we stabilize the spine with hardware. This is a complex surgery, but it has been refined over the last 20 years. Now the problem with our spine is that our spine is in the middle of our body. And what that means for a surgeon, you have to get in. And uh, there are ways to get in either we cut open your belly. By the way, I have done all these surgeries. I, have, I, I would uh, be called an expert in all these surgeries. Cut open your belly, you push the bowel and the organs to the side, major vessels to the side, you go from the front, or you go from the back, when you go from the back, we, not figuratively, we literally fill you up. We cut, oh, we cut all the muscles of the spine, and guess what? The, the amount of the damage we do sometimes offsets the benefit of the surgery. Now, the, the surgery that I'm describing, we get to the spine to a tube that is barely thicker than this parent. Now, so you know, I did three of those surgeries today. Um, two of those patients came from, uh, one came from Idaho, one came from West Virginia to get the surgery done here today in Minneapolis. So this is a common problem. These patients are being told, no, you're too sick, you're too old. You have to live with the pain. And they don't live with the pain. Most of them, they decondition and die with the pain. And Considering those surgeries that are uh, done already in the United States, Amanda, you did a research. How many surgeries, spine surgeries were done in the United States uh, last year? About 1.6 million surgeries are done, but that's only surgeries that are done because um, a lot of doctors sometimes turn patients away for. And they come to us. They come, yeah. Well, to, and, and to that point, the reason why they turn them away is because they don't care about them. It's just that the risk profile of the technique for, for the surgery that those patients need after those patients fail their conservative measures is is, is too risky. Yeah, it's so not justified. They're essentially the the um, the uh, mortality rates are too high. So those doctors are actually doing their job. They're doing right. their job. Um, no, they're doing their job to a point. But if you confront or you tell that surgeon, there is another way to help this surgeon, like. I'm a neurosurgeon. If somebody comes with a cardiac problem to me, I say go to a cardiologist. Right. As well, I'm not a pediatric spine surgeon. If a child comes to me with a pediatric problem, I send that patient to Dr. Kim, who's a fantastic pediatric scoliosis surgeon. I, I cannot wash my, uh, my discipline 
of any kind of, uh, I cannot give them a free pass here because we should know better. Many times when we confront them with the data, the reaction is not, you know, show me the data. The reaction is not happy. It's not true. I don't have, have time to review your data. I do not have time to review the data. And you see that all the time. Even in the universities, I see that all the time. I think this is a betrayal of the public trust if you are confronted with the data that could benefit the patient and then you decide not even look over the data for whatever reason, whatever reason. Well, to your point, I think we need to go back to my earlier point about incumbent interests. Okay, so many of these spine surgeons are, you know, paid legally and uh, above board are paid millions of dollars per year by large device companies. Okay, so even though show them, you know, for, for things that, you know, for products where they have royalties and where they do consulting, so it's all above board, it's all legal. Okay, but even though you can show them from a scientific medical standpoint, this is not only better for your patient, but it's also better for you in terms of your time and, you know, and, and, and your outcomes. In the back of their mind, they don't want to sacrifice those $3 million checks every year. Yeah, and I think a certain point as well here, we are what we are talking about is that um, obviously what we do is extremely technical. It is extremely technical. Like imagine cutting somebody's skull, taking a tumor out, putting them back together, and he lives. This is for the spine. The anatomy of the spine is really more complex. Being able to be like today, I put many, many screws in a structure that is uh, it's, uh, called pellicle. It is uh, it's about seven and a half millimeter. I put seven and a half millimeter screw in a seven and a half millimeter pellicle. And I did over and over that again. Without one side, I would be in the patient's aorta, the patient would bleed out. The other side, the screw would be in spinal cord, the patient would be paralyzed. The amount of the knowledge and technology and expertise goes to this is nothing short of going to the moon and back. But this is acquired over years. Once we are done with our residency, where we acquire this knowledge, we get so busy. Coming back to your uh, so, uh, question, why not many more people are doing that? You know, we are human as well. We want to enjoy our life. Yeah. We don't want to be in the perpetual kind of training, all this, except if you have no other hobbies like me, then exactly that's what you do. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid to hear you say that about doctors don't want to yeah. keep learning. Yeah. Right, as we yeah. know, science by definition is continually Evolving as we gain more knowledge, you know, it's about hypotheses, test, yes or no, and then reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. So the fact that you just mentioned that most surgeons don't want to stay up, you know, continue learning, it's kind of a scary thought. It really is. It is, but you know what saves us is they have a certain period and they die out, and the new generation always new learns new things. And this is phrase is not from me. This phrase is from Max Planck, the, the German uh, the theoretical physicist who invented quantum physics. He, when he kept, by the way, this cell phone, every, the way you look at us and able to hear us is based on all the knowledge we gained from the quantum physics. That's how the chip worked. We couldn't build these chips. Our, our society right so, now is completely dependent upon that technology. And, oh, this, yeah. and this came out um, by Max Planck started that Thing. This was just too crazy for everybody. And he was laughed off. He was not taken serious. And there's a phrase from him. He said that the science uh, improves one funeral at a time. Because what we are doing, it is uh, sometimes not evidence-based medicine. It's eminent-based medicine. Meaning that few people in eminent position, chair of a thing, the people do what they say. Really, it doesn't matter if that, there's any evidence for that or not. And that is, I think, what, and I think I'm sad to see that 120 years after Mark Planck, that he's still dealing with this eminent kind of science, that, um, uh, that an eminent person on their way have to die before a new thing is ushered in science or medicine. So it's almost a corollary to the concept of creative destruction. 
and that's going to end the business. Yeah. Whereas, you know, with these innovations, the old way of doing business, people are so married to it, and it's the way that they've always done that they built a whole infrastructure to support it. It takes a lot to move them mm -hmm. off that dime in order to embrace something new, which ultimately three, five years down the road will be substantially better and more effective. Now, the part that is personal to me is while we are going through this natural process on innovation and accepting innovation, there are patients today gathering their pills to commit suicide because they are told by their surgeon they have to live with it. They are told we have a problem, we have to live with it. And, and it is sometimes hard to be you know, old, but it's much harder to be old and in horrible pain and dependent on everybody else. And the, the, the numbers are probably much higher than you want to have been. The number of people um, that uh, they don't decide, they don't want to live with that, whereas we have a solution for them. And that as well, that is very personal to me because I have been by many of my patients. If that's all what's left, I choose not to live. And think about that sampling size. Okay, so how many patients do you treat per year? Um, I treat probably over a thousand patients a year, but I probably perform I, on a fraction of them surgery. Correct. Right. Probably many thousands, and probably the, the one uh, the, a small fraction of them get surgery. So, and what a substantial of them that, that you get, or a substantial number of them that you get surgery, are in continuous dire pain, and many of them have been told. You're not qualified for the particular you know, surgery that you need because of your risk profile. And then if you extrapolate that across the country, there's probably hundreds of thousands or millions of people that are basically you know destined you know, or or required to live out their remaining years in dire pain. Right. Yeah. Um, I think one of the problem in medicine as well is that the true beneficiary of the medicine are the patient, the public. But the delivery is not like any other service. Like, you know, if I go and buy this, I go to a store, Apple produces this, I go to a store, I buy it, I pay for it. Mm -hmm. Now, and it's your decision too yeah. to go and buy it where, where you're going is insurance. Yes. But look at that. Imagine now, um, John, try to. In this model, Apple produce it, there is a store, I go to the store, I buy it and I pay for it. Try to fit medicine in this concept. Or just, yeah, absolutely, because right now, especially for specialty medicine, mm -hmm. because the actual customer is dependent upon what is known as the learned intermediary or the doctor to, to tell them which products they need. Yeah. Completely. Now, imagine that uh, this is produced by Apple, but the Apple has to go and sell it to the store, and then I go to a second store, and that second store send me to the store they choose to get the and they to all of them. So, and on top of that, I'm not paying for it. Somebody else, an insurance, is paying for this. It's so convoluted that the benefits to the true beneficiary doesn't really calculate the way a regular service would. Correct. Correct. And for that reason, I think, you know, we decided uh, about uh, the, a few years ago that uh, we, that is what this is about, to go to the public. We need to make the public knowledgeable about their choices. And um, sometimes when I put this, uh, my result and so on uh, online, and many of my colleagues are very critical that I'm so open about that I put patient testimonial and so on and so forth and my results out there for the public. But I, I, the way I see that with the internet, like what we are doing right now, the public has never been more knowledgeable than today. They know their choices and they are aware, like those two patients that the, the, I did the surgery today, they got the information from online. Yeah. And they, and they, they so one of them actually has read all our papers because I chose to put our papers for a public domain that anybody can read that rather than in a journal that you have to pay 
$150 to be able to get a copy of the paper. Absolutely. And, and with that knowledge comes power. So 20, 30 years, even 10 or 15 years ago, the patient, for lack of a better word, was at the mercy of their primary care provider mm -hmm. or their specialist to, to, to say, yes, here's what you need. Right now that that patient has much more education, much more knowledge, they are in a much more powerful position to have a much larger say in their healthcare. Right. So, um, Amanda, you helped me a lot to put many of this information disseminate through the internet sphere. Um, um, we have, if you don't want to mention any names, but you have few friends all across the world. Frenemies. Frenemies. <laughs> yeah. So, what? Now, I, I want to go both ways. You know, what are the things that you hear, or what? What do they say? Now, now our colleagues. Uh, they, I'm talking about the spine surgeon. That uh, when how they react when I tell them I did three surgeries today. The, uh, each of the surgery, two level, few level fusion. The, each of the surgeries was actually 50 minutes, 50 minutes, 52 minutes. Our blood loss was less than half a cup of coffee, and all these patients are going home tomorrow, most likely within 24 hours, because we have statistic of that. I put this information out there. What are a few things you hear out? Um, I can think of two or three main things that I hear a lot. Obviously, one of them is what about their lower doses? Yeah. That's a big one. Another one is speed isn't the most important thing. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not never about the speed. It's about efficiency. And I tell, tell that as well to many of my colleagues that it's not like I make a seven hour surgery in 50 minutes. This is a different kind of surgery that we're performing. This is like I tell patient, we are in Minneapolis. How long would you need to drive to Chicago from here? Eight hours. So yeah, somewhere between eight, eight hours. Imagine if you have a very good car, very good road, you could drive there maybe six hours, maybe five and a half hours, then you are pushing. Yep. Anything beyond that, I would say, if if I had no idea what flying is, if driving is was the only concept of transportation I knew, I would say, and you would come and tell me I, you got from here to Chicago in one and a half hour, I say, something's wrong with you. Right. Either you, you are very you're reckless, you're lying, and so on. But if you, it, if it takes you seven hours from here to fly to Chicago, as well is something wrong with you. Yeah. Because that is a different mode of transportation that should not take that long. Now, as well, and a concept of what's possible and not possible has been well described in the economy and in the game theory. Um, you know what I'm going to refer to? The Kobayashi effect. Yep. Now, hot dog. Yeah. Tell, tell us. What, <laughs> you know, tell us about the Kobayashi. What do you know about the hot dog guy? All that I know is uh, Kobayashi is is the famous guy uh, each year at uh, the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest yeah. in uh, Coney Island. He's yeah. the one who wins every year, and he's this little skinny. Uh, Japanese I, I think he's Japanese. Yeah. Correct. So the the idea was that you know. I don't do that at home. Don't go and do hot dog eating contest. But it's not healthy. But um, it has been going on for many, many, many decades. Correct. This hot dog concept. How fast? How many hot dogs can you eat in 11 minutes? I don't know why it's 11 minutes. But the record was somewhere between 25 and 34 years for decades. It was just moved from 25 to 28 to 30. All of a sudden, this thin skinny Japanese guy come and he needs money he goes and eats sick dogs is Double. he the one who's like dipping them in water yes yes that is the idea see everybody until then thought inside of the box how many hot dogs can I eat in 11 minutes this guy made a science of it he took it apart and find out how he can improve each dog. Like, he literally, nothing in the rules get that you have to eat the hot dog as, as a whole. So he took the buns, put it in water, it out, and put it in mouth, and then he actually swallowed the hot dogs as a whole. He made the science of it, completely changed the concept. And now all of a sudden, he went from 30 to 60, you know, that people know 
they can do it in a different way. Until then, this is all what you can do. But once they know you can do it differently, no, everybody does it. And that is another thing that people think this is about this superior technique. It is not. It's a different mode of surgery that enables you have to learn it, obviously. And I have the highest reported number. But once you learn that, this is a learn, learnable technique. And we have a proof of that. You tell us about that. So what's interesting, so of, so of the surgeons that we train, and I'm going to give the example of uh, uh, Dr. Sonny Kim, who is, who is a veteran surgeon, tens of thousands of cases. He's been uh, practicing for over 30 years. Okay, And he was known for doing big, big spine surgeries, as Ahmed alluded to earlier. He has expertise in pediatric scoliosis. Okay, So with respect to Hamid, it took him about 500 cases to be able to do complex pathologies. Okay, With Hamid training Sonny and identifying for him prior to Sonny having to stumble upon it on his own, all of the potential obstacles that you can run into with this technique. Sonny uh, achieved or basically got to a level of the same of proficiency that took home in 500 cases in 550 cases. And that is, a, the, I think that's the nature of any kind of teaching. The first person learns it based on the hard small, hard yeah. way, <laughs> a small increment, and then the, all the others have to, don't have to do the same kind of hard way. They learn it easier because they can replicate, like literally it took me 180 cases until ended up with the draping system that we are using today. Because I tried seven to nine different draping methods. It took us about 200 cases to just identify in this crowded room or what is the optimum position of the, the big instrument, like CR or the and so on and so forth. Now, they don't have to do that. They can just go replicate. The knowledge is uh, transferable very easily well, and I think one thing that you might want to make note of, Hamid, is the fact that when, when, when we tell people or we show them that instead of taking four hours, the actual what's called skin-to-skin -skin time was 47 minutes. Again, it's not because the surgeon is rushing through anything. There's a dichotomy between access time and treatment time. And the reason why the traditional techniques, they have an access time of, of over an hour, and sometimes, in some cases, depending upon the size of the patient, so to speak, several hours. Okay, and then once they reach the pathology, they're able to treat it the same way we do. Our access, our access time, or the access time of the Olive technique, is about what eighty-seven seconds. Yeah. Well, typically minutes. Minutes. Yeah. Um, Why is that? What What causes the huge difference? In an open surgery, traditional surgery, first of all, you cut the middle. What's going to happen? This is going to bleed. You literally, with electricity, cook the tissue to stop the bleeding. By the way, that creates a lot of dead tissue and it's ready to get infected. That is why open surgery has a 3 to 5% risk of infection. And we have at this point 0.17. You're creating an open wound. Yeah. Right. And then, once you stop the bleeding, you go to the next layer, and you repeat that again and again. You cut, you cook the tissue, and then once you are there, you cut uh, especially a big part of the bone in the spine, and guess what? The spine is already weak, and you cut more of it and make it bigger until you get to the disc. Once you get to the disc, that is where the whole problem starts, because our spinal cord is surrounded by a plexus of veins. They call them epidural uh, venous plexus. That's the fitting. You touch them, they bleed. And you spend a lot of time to stop that bleeding to get access to the disc. As a matter of fact, more than half of the blood loss, more than, I mean, during the spine surgery, is when you get to that plexus, you're, you're trying to stop that bleeding to get inside of the disc. Now, that makes sense that it takes a long time create lots of dead tissue and that makes sense as well that if you have to go deeper it takes longer and we have a data about that you know that if the BMI, as a matter of fact many of our societies say that if the BMI is over, over 40 uh, body mass index 
don't do so much. We easily turn this social media people like BMI 50 and above successfully set them on the next day. We have data showing them that the BMI doesn't really impact their outcome. No more uh, risk of infection, no more morbidity, mortality, and so on and so forth. We have we made a chart of it. And this is for me personal when I show that to my colleagues that they, their curiosity doesn't go to Mount Everest, that they don't come back and ask me, I want to see the raw data. If, if this is true, and I'm, uh, you know, we have we gathered, we gather, uh, as you know, both of you know, a very obsessive composite amount of data, that the amount of the data we are collecting is tremendous. And I offer all of them to come and look at the raw data, and all the, some of them, all they care about is few comment and linking. Yeah, they're Twitter. That's called Twitter fingers. Twitter fingers. Yeah, yeah. they are very active on the social media, mm -hmm. but they don't spend the same amount of time to actually look over the data. Well, and what's interesting about that because I've seen those comments, yeah. right? And I've but heard. Which one have you seen? I've heard. <laughs> I've heard a ton of. I've heard basically eight of uh, key uh, objections. But, Let's go. but but one of the f the first one is always for a minimally invasive technique where I'm not opening up the patient, the risk of nerve root damage is much higher. Okay, let's go over that. And then with open surgery, and it's because I can't see that nerve root on that fluoroscopic image. Well, um, let me use another analogy from the aviation. There's so-called VFR, visual flight rule, and there's so-called IFR, instrument flight rule. In the visual flight rule, like open surgery, you open it up, you look at it, in the, uh, there are certain rules that they, in the, like most of the airplanes uh, that are flying commercially, they are not visual flight rule, they are instrument flight rule. What we do is mostly instrument flight rule. We have a machine, a computer, checking your nerves, and I'm going with a probe close to that, and then it give me signal. Now, visual flight rule is like flying a small plane in a day light and so on. And the instrument flight rule is flying from here to Germany. Which one is safer? Everybody knows that the visual flight rule are never as accurate as instrument flight rule. Same way here. We have enough data to show by us using probe and computer that check the nerves while they're in life. And as well, in our surgery, we have two x-rays that shows the tip of our instrument in every level. After having done this now for over 1,500 cases, 3,300 levels, and, and for the last 10 years, I think we have enough data to show, just open up the books, show the raw data. There's no comparison. In, in our study, only one patient in 303 patients after a year still had nerve injury. That risk is reported from ours is 0.3. 0.3%, correct. The, in, the, in the open for open traditional surgery, that has been reported lowest in a very limited group has been reported from 0.3 to 35%. This has been reported and generally is accepted for 3 to uh, about two, uh, 1 to 4 or two to three percent so that risk is a fraction of open surgery so i've got to ask you a question so why is it that you know a certain percentage of all of patients immediate post-op complain of nerve root irritation versus patients that undergo what's known as a t-lift or a transferaminal open they're not complaining of nerve root irritation post-op post why is, is that that's a very good question and we systematically looked into that the, you have to see an old patient and a traditional surgery patient post-op day one to really understand um, what you're dealing with like imagine if you go to your grandmother and your uh, your grandmother is on fire, she's not comp going to complain about the hair, the, 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 the hair color didn't came out right. This patient after open surgery, they're on fire. They're happy if they can turn from side to side. The numbness on the top of their left foot or the, that they cannot move, bring their foot, that's the least problem. 
They just want this horrible pain to stop. Whereas my patient, I have tough testimonial. Many of them just the day after the surgery, they are looking at you, they're smiling, you're ready to go home. Now, if you if you're not on fire, the color of your that the 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 the, the, the yeah, you're going to pay attention to other things. That, that so comes, it's a hierarchy of discomfort, shall yeah. we say. Yes. Now, practically, what we in methodically looked into that, that rate, that initial, and in all the papers we look at, they just put it on the table. They go to long-term data. They are very vague about But we methodically looked at that early, middle, long. It was 12% for immediate post-surgery, for open traditional surgery. It was 8.2 in our even that is lower. But our patients are ready to go home. They have packed their stuff. And they just want to know, why is the top of the yeah, food wet. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels wet inside. Yeah. Right? And, uh, but that has a fantastic prognosis. We know that. Even for open surgeries, it has a relatively good prognosis. Uh, but uh, even looking at that, it was lower in our study. And we have enough data to collaborate on that. The fact is that. They don't, uh, they don't have a single, I don't have a single technique to search for infection. And if you see one spinal infection, you know how tremendously uh, detrimental that is. Or you know that uh, this is the public data. What did you find out, John, about the hospital stay in the state of Minnesota? So the average hospital stay for traditional lumbar fusion surgeries ranges anywhere from about 3.2 to 8 days post op for Olaf, my understanding is, and this has been very, very consistent and published data by the uh, Minnesota Hospital Association, is 1.6 days. How can you say that? How, how do you know that's 1.6 days? Well, because there's one hospital where it's fire spine, they are the spine surgery service. Yeah, you're so the only spine surgery. Yeah. They are the only game in town, basically. It's Riverview Health up in Crookston, Minnesota. And when you look up Riverview Health under DRG 455, which is for anterior posterior lumbar fusion, the average length of stay is 1.6 days. Whereas that number for some of the hospitals here in the town is 7%, 7 days, right? Correct. And what's very interesting too, the hospitals where, uh, where we also bring patients in the cities, when you include our surgeries, your average length of stay is about 2.4 days. When you tease out, so to speak, our surgeries from that data, the average length of stay is 4.2 days. So we practically bring the average hospital stay for the hospital to 1.5 days or 1.7 days. We, we basically cut it by a factor of two the way uh, Kobayashi yeah. <laughs> increased by a factor of two. Factor of two. So right. they must love you, John. Do they? The hospitals here? <laughs> yeah. Me personally? No. Oh, no. In terms of, well, what's very interesting, so so due to the fact that we are getting the word out, we have a, we've been generating patient demand, 130 new patients per month on average for the last two years. Okay, so we have a very large backlog of surgeries that we need a venue for. So on several occasions, we've gone to a particularly large system where, where Dr. Abbasi and Dr. Kim currently have, have privileges, and we've asked them for more OR block time. Well, okay. the reception? Well, it was interesting due to the fact that one of the key factors for not giving us that block time was what they told us was they have contracts with a, with a large medical device manufacturer that at the end of the year, the hospital needs to meet certain volume limits on their implant purchase, purchases from that particular manufacturer in order to get their rebate. So they were concerned that by giving us more block time, the old of surgery, which, which can't use those particular uh, implants because for obvious reasons, this particular technique requires specialized instrumentation. The old of surgery would essentially have too large a percentage of their OR time, which would result in them not purchasing a sufficient amount of these devices from this large device company, and they don't get their rebate. So I, you know, quite frankly asked, I said, so you mean to tell me that this particular company sets your OR scheduling policies? 
and I heard no comment. So. And considering that you know we can do six of those surgeries in one day and increase the efficiency of the hospital. And the patient's and going home in a day and a half. And the patient don't stay there. No. Well, and not to mention, like, those procedures, I'm sure, take much longer than Olaf. So yeah. it's one patient versus two or Many three. Patients. We can do six in the time it takes them to do two. In I fact, think. Hamid's home for dinner after yeah. he's done six. But, you know, I think that may, you know, not come out What how important that is. Except when you have gone through the COVID, you know, how limited the resources of the hospital were. If you can make the patient stay in the hospital where every bed is valuable, 1.6 days versus seven days. If you can use that highly skilled people in one hour, like today, all my surgeries were under one hour, skin to skin, for two level fusion. I, I have a, we have good data. That is the average uh, three, four hour surgery. Well, and you stopped by my office at 2.30 this yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Well, that was after I spent and checked on all my patients. That's my point. And then yeah. I did all my dictation and so on. That was long after I did all the other work. And considering the impact this can have, that is, uh, for me, just not understandable how uh, hospitals, some hospitals, but how any hospital wouldn't, you know, literally want to be your best buddy, well, What do you think going on? What's confusing me comes down to, so, you know, I'm going to sound a little, you know, skeptical and, you know, and whatever, but what's interesting, so there's two basic concepts here. There's patient outcomes, best interest of patient, and, and then there's financial, all right? And, and in many cases, you know, as people have, have heard or they hear every day, one is typically sacrificed for the other, okay? The beauty of what we deliver is there's no trade-off. We're optimizing both. Not, not only are our patient outcomes better, but the financial performance of these surgeries for these facilities is better by a, a, by a factor of five or six X. I'm, I'm going to almost sound like a conspiracy theorist right now, but it might be some, uh, uh, how do you call those, those, those uh, thing, uh, uh, that in, like Da Vinci Code, that what's what they, what they call this uh, special... Like a plot, yes? No, 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 no. no. no so, I almost... Oh, I wanted, so they, they like these cults or like cult. special... It's, it's not, I, I, it almost sounds like it's a cultish thing wrong, mm -hmm. I'm holding you back, because it is good for the patient, it is bottom line good for the hospital, and today, two patients flew all across the United States to go to Correct. this hospital. And, and essentially, so I want to I want to add to that point. It's not as though uh, our practice is relying on this healthcare system to bring us patients. No. We're bringing them patients, yeah. and still the red carpet is not effectively rolled out. Which you know, and what's interesting to to contrast that, we're treated like kings up in rural Minnesota, where we have a professional service agreement with the hospital that I mentioned before, called Riverview Health in Kirkston. Kirkston, for those of you that do not know, is an hour north of Fargo on the Minnesota-North Dakota border. And we are providing, people are coming from the entire United States to Kirkston, Minnesota, to get their spine cured. It's a center of excellence where the, the post-op length of stay for a what has been traditionally a high acuity lumbar fusion surgery is 1.6 days. Shorter than any university, any bigger system, in the center of medical expertise, which is Minnesota. Minnesota. Well, and, and one hour away from Mayo Clinic, yeah. even. Yeah. Which Correct. Yeah. That's, I wasn't going to mention that, but yeah, oh. I was going to say that it rhymes with KO. I, yeah, I have, I have uh, almost in the last 12 months, I had like two dozen patients coming from around the Mayo Clinic from Rochester to Crookston, Minnesota to get their care. Oh, I know. And, and in fact, I remember uh, three particular patients, elderly women, that had adult degenerative scoliosis. They were told by the surgeon at the Mayo Clinic that the surgery they required would have to be done over two days, that he would have to basically cut them from what's called your occipitals, the base of your skull, to your, um, your sacrum, so that he could straighten them out, okay? We were able to, well, I'll let Hal explain it, we were able to effectively treat all three of those patients with, with surgeries that were less than two hours. 
and send them home within two days. And that is uh, something consistently we have been. I think the problem or the maybe the blessing of Crookston is it's a community. Everybody in the community knows everybody. So when they say they are there for the care of the community, it is not empty word. They actually care. They actually care. Because however you look at it, you cannot care for patient care, have the data, because many of these people, they have the actual data that they are treating for years patient there. You cannot say you are for the care of patient. You have the actual data and not roll out the red carpet for you to even create more care there. The only thing I can explain here is that this, there's a schizophrenic dissociation between the motto we are for care of patient to execution of providing that care. And uh, on top of that, and as well, the financial, at the end of the day, all of it is not more expensive than traditional surgery. The devices required for it are no. No, the same, same cost. Same cost, in contrary to some other technology that the iPhone 14 is cost cost your arm and leg and Correct. your firstborn son. No. This you go and buy cost. a cash even. Well, that even well, that's and the hospitals are being paid the same amount for the old surgery as they are for a big open surgery. Yeah. yeah. So and they uh, consider those patients go home sooner. So meaning that is actually beneficial for the hospital. But there is a dissociation between putting all these results and the, the premise that you are here here for patients' care to to actually so what are some of the other Olaf objections that you guys see? Like, let me talk about the lordosis. Yeah, know. what is what <laughs> about technicality? The you know that yeah. like, um, um, I would actually talk about that the special insurance that they have their own surgeons. Uh, we provided to them information about how less our patient get infected. We provided to them information about, and we wanted them, you know. Even train their surgeon for them. Obviously, they go to their surgeon. They are their surgeons are in their 60s and 70s. They have no interest to go back to school and learn. Now, and we provided them actual data. Now, John, what did they come back to you? With? What did they ask you? Did they ask you uh, how you can help them or when's the training? No, when they basically the so. Their response to us after we presented all of our data and explained our outcomes and compared it to the outcomes of the uh, surgeons that were in, in their current network or that work at their hospitals, they basically came back and called our procedure experimental. But they reversed that. And yes, yes. So after demonstrating to them the actual data, as well as, you know, sending it to uh, their uh, their their C-suite. About two weeks later, they came back and they re reversed that. But then they gave you a different reason, didn't they? Like, didn't they keep saying like, "Oh, actually, it's this. Now it's this." Like, yeah. they they we tried to use a technicality, a code, in the, the how these are coded, to uh, to say that this surgery doesn't qualify. Now imagine that you have a, a heart defibrillator that going to go and save somebody's life, but that the code says, uh, you know, it should be red. And I have And yours blue. is blue. Yeah. And yours is blue. And you save people's life. You say, no, you, this, is a, this is not red. You cannot save people's life because, because this is blue, which has, truly nothing to do with what you are trying to do. Well, I'm sorry, Hamid, but what they were focused on is is what I deem to be prescriptive requirements, yeah. procedural aspects versus substantive or performance aspects. And I think what got them was the fact that I pointed out that why would they be requiring their membership, their covered lives, to receive a surgery that on average at their hospital has a post-op length of stay of 6.2 days versus one that has a post-op length of stay of 1.6 days. Yeah, so if uh, you are if working for a health partner, we are talking about you, <laughs> okay? 
but you're not doing a service to your member, and you are being dishonest if uh, you tell, tell your patient you are there to give them the best care, but then when we show you what we can do for your patient, based on that you have your own hospital, you have your own surgeon, um, you literally exclude us from your network, so your patient has to pay a lot more to come to get care from us or have to do a surgery that has 30 times more risk of infection. And these are only the patients that the surgeon will operate on? Yes. Not the ones with the high BMI, elderly, too young? Yeah. I'm Which to mention the BMI thing again, I read actually that um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is technically obese because of his height to yeah. weight ratio. So you're gonna like these is doctors. Rock? Is it rock? Yeah. Is rock? These doctors. All professional would, athletes are technically obese. Yeah. So these doctors would turn away these professional I, athletes. I think, yeah, no, I think they are a little more. Uh, the, the, I think most of surgeons are a little more uh, judicious about. It. Yeah. Do you it, think? It, it depends whether the BMI is from based on muscle versus fat. Right, but when you look <laughs> on your LinkedIn comments, they always say, "I would never do surgery on a patient with that BMI." Yeah. But they don't. And as well. I, what really was hurtful that some of them even tried to body shame the yeah. patient. You know, obesity is a disease. And these are American surgeons. So they, they should know they better. look outside. Yeah, they should know better than, you know. Tell them to lose 100 pounds or they can't get the surgery. What about 250 yeah. pounds? Yeah. And, uh, or, you know, you, and the thing is, they should take responsibility. How are you going to walk and lose You're in weight? agonizing you pain. Not, you exactly. Walk. Exactly. No water aerobics. That's what they always say. No, what I don't understand, we are supposed to be empathic. We are supposed to, um, you know, be able to em have empathy for our patient rather than say, say, you deserve to be in pain because you just let yourself go and now you are a 350. That is unbecoming of our profession to do that. And yet, what? No, we have few minutes time. I, I want to uh, finish it up on time uh, at five o'clock. But the few other comments that the lordosis that we can correct that we can put the cage in the front and back. That's not a question. But they don't. They just repeat the same question. They don't listen to the answer. Correct. So what? Uh, each time. Uh, what other uh, the objection do you hear? I cannot get a a sufficient enough discectomy plate preparation through that eight millimeter diameter tube. Come to us and we show it to you. It is not only possible. The surgeon who performed that they use this instrumentation. We put a tube in, and we can go sixty times inside and outside of the tube without putting spinal cord as a danger. There is a word called durotomy, meaning that in a, in a accidentally. We nick the skin around the spinal cord and let them use, they will lose uh, CSS or spinal fluid. It's a mess. That rate of open surgery is 8.7%. What is our rate of? Uh, so, to date, 0% after almost 1,700 cases. I'm going to say no. So, you, you go ahead with some other objections. We, we touched on this a little bit, but the fact that you post on Do Curious versus the paid for Good Spine one. Journal. Because I uh, my patient uh, are able to go to Curious, get that paper, and just read it. And you will be surprised. They are, uh, they are smarter than ever. There's Google. They can look up the phrases. They can take it, print it out, talk to their family, friends, or the physical therapist friends or family doctor and so on and rather than in a professional journal you have to you either pay about $150 per article or you pay about $3,000 to get a, a subscription one last one that I want to bring up because it's one that I hear quite often and it's the focus of the reps of the other device companies have trained these doctors in terms of looking at when they look at alternative devices to be used for this fusion technique, one of the, the, the things they bring up, they say, well, the footprint or the area of that, what's called a cage or a spacer, is, is too small. I'm, I'm concerned that I'll get way too much what's called subsidence. Would you speak to that? Well, wait, what is subsidence? 
meaning that you know that spacer that we put in it's smaller comparing to some of the spacers that go from the front or side because most of the devices that go from the back they have the same footprint the idea is here that if you put something bigger that the, yeah, there's more space contact and there's less overall force on it and it doesn't sink into the bone um, I love that movie with John with, uh, with Tom Cruise. Show me the cash. Show me the money. Show me the money. Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Um, and uh, the, practically, I apologize. Can you answer that? Tell them I'll be here in a minute. Say you don't. I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm always on call. <laughs> so, show me the result. What is the result? Patient outcome. And I'm happy to compare the patient outcome. To any of those cases with a bigger footprint, they have no advantage except those surgeries are much longer and have more risk of infection. It seems that our body, and we have been doing this with the same footprint, these uh, cages from the back, for 20 years before we start doing it from other places. Is that the uh, Okay. Now, it is five o'clock right now. And, uh, and I have a call from the ER I have to answer. So I'm going to conclude this. I'm, I'm Dr. Abbasi with the uh, IS Life. This is our uh, essence of medicine. Amanda Armagas, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.